right, so we're going to deal with human origins as the final topic in human biology. We've gone through and we've considered how an individual develops, and then once developed, how the 11 organ systems function, and how we can maintain those 11 organ systems through proper exercise and dietary habits. Now I want to talk about how we ended up here to begin with. What's our story through time? And the first thing that we need to admit is that there are two competing views. There are two competing views on human origins, and really two competing views on origins of the galaxy, the universe, life, and everything. And those two competing views are going to be the evolutionary worldview and the other is the biblical or the Christian worldview. The other thing that we have to admit at the onset of this conversation is that only one of these views can really be correct. Only one of those views is going to be correct. So if evolution is true, I think we have to conclude that the biblical account is false. And if the biblical account is false, I think we have to conclude that the Bible is false. The biblical view, if it is true, then I think we have to conclude that the evolutionary view is false. And it really isn't that simple to differentiate. We're looking at the same data, we're looking at it from two different angles, and even though we're looking at two different angles, both the evolutionary worldview and the biblical worldview are extremely amazing. Evolution does a very good job of summarizing the view of the data, how they view that data. But in the same breath, I'm also going to say that the biblical worldview and individuals who are working on a creation model of origins and creation model of everything can also explain a lot about the data that's available. So it's not just like evolution is bad and we're going to make it stupid or vice versa. We're talking about two really good explanations for what we observe. Now, the reason that I believe only one can be correct, it all comes down for me to time. The evolutionary worldview is going to require a massive amount of time. And in that massive amount of time, it requires a massive amount of death. In order for the world to, or the universe to have existed for 20 billion years, Earth to have existed for 4.6 billion years, and life on Earth to have existed and evolved for 3 billion years, we need death to have been almost a constant reality. So if we try to compromise and apply an evolutionary worldview to our biblical understanding of Genesis, the Psalms, and really the Bible as a whole, we have to admit that before the fall, before the fall of Adam and Eve, there was death. Adam and Eve would have been homo sapiens, right? Common man, modern man, like you and I. And we know from an evolutionary perspective that man has existed on the planet for about 50 to 100,000 years in its modern condition, what we call homo sapiens. So if Adam and Eve were homo sapiens, which was, is what seems to be reflected in the biblical account, they've only been on the scene for about 100,000 years. Three billion years of time has been required to go from a single cell organism up to present day diversity on the planet. That means that there's almost an entire history of death that preceded Adam and Eve. Now, in the biblical account, what we know is that after Eve took from the tree of knowledge of good and evil and consumed the fruit and then also gave her passive husband a bite of that fruit as well, they were ejected from the garden. And as punishment for that sin, as sin entered the world, there needed to be a punishment. As a punishment for that sin, God said that basically your days are numbered. And you're going to die. So if you look at Romans chapter 6, verse 20, it says, uh, verse 23, it says, For the wages of sin is death, 
but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So if the wages of sin is death, then if death preceded sin by three billion years, it's, in, it's a lie. Death had been in the world for three billion years prior to Adam and Eve having sin enter the world. That makes Romans 6.23 a lie. That means everything else in the Bible is probably not infallible. It's probably fallible. It probably is just a story. And so I think that if you want to take the evolutionary worldview, you have to accept that death precedes sin, and sin is no longer, or death is no longer the payment for sin. And that makes God a lie. When you wrote Romans 6. So let's deal with this. Let's deal with both of these worldviews and see if we can come up with some sort of consensus. Now I want to start with evolution. And the like 300,000 foot view of evolution, you can look around what you have. And you could go up today and you could probably find dozens and dozens and dozens of different unique organisms. Plants, animals, maybe some bacteria, if you're looking at a microscope. Evolution would purport that all of that diversity that we observe today on the planet, with over a million species, individual species of plants, animals, uh, produce, bacteria, being identified, all of that diversity, all living things or living organisms have descended or come from the same single-celled ancestor. All living organisms descend from the same cell. Now, this is your primordial ancestor in the evolutionary world. Where did this cell come from? How did this cell arrive on the scene? And I think to answer that question, we really have to kind of get our head around what would this organism, the single cell, this primordial ancestor, have to look like? One of the requirements is it would need a replicating, replicating molecule that contained information. So something like an RNA molecule associated to a DNA molecule. We had to be able to take information from that organism and replicate it to pass it on to a next generation organism. Not only did we need the RNA and the DNA, we also needed to have that wrapped up in something like a lipid protein bilayer. In other words, we needed the machinery to pass on information, and we needed the physiology to protect that information so it could be passed on. So we needed the proteins. We needed the enzymes. We needed the things that would be able to catalyze these reactions. And in the evolutionary worldview, the universe has been here for 20 billion years. Earth has been here for 4.6 billion years. Life has been here for about 3 billion years. So not only do we need all of this, but we need to have that develop between the time points of 20 billion and 3 billion, so 17 billion years to develop that. And then once we've developed that, we need 3, 3 billion years to get to the massive amount of diversity that we have today. So 20 billion years ago to 3 billion years ago, we need our RNA and our protein with the Bible. And then between 3 billion to today, we need to be able to build the diversity that's around us. So is it even possible? Can this even begin to happen? So the first thing I want to do is I want to take a look at the diversity. Diversity is just simply going to be defined as differences between organisms. 
and even to a certain degree within organisms. We're all homo sapiens in here, I'm pretty sure. And there's diversity in this classroom. There's male, there's female. There's different colored hair, there's different colored eyes. At the very genetic level, the very genomic level of your cells, there are different genes. Some of us have one set of genes, so let's take a specific gene like hemoglobin. The sequence for your hemoglobin may be different than my hemoglobin. You may be able to carry oxygen better than I can. There are these differences that exist. That's what we call diversity. Diversity has to become a reality from a single undiverse organism. We have one cell that eventually has to, over a three billion, time, three billion year time period, become millions of diverse species across the planet. So can we achieve diversity as a result of evolution? And this is one of those big questions that's actually asked by evolutionary scientists, evolutionary biologists and geologists, is can diversity be created through known principles of evolution? Okay. In other words, can we take a unpredictable natural process and use that to develop the diversity that we see today. Another way to put this, is there a natural process that we can turn to, or natural processes that we can turn to, that fit the bill, and given the three billion years, would be able to create the diversity that we see? The evolutionary scientist has really identified four factors of change. So four things that can drive change in a species to create new diversity. The four factors are going to be chance. You might also sort of refer to that chance as luck. When the volcano, well, volcano erupted, you were on the other side, so you can get wiped out like all your brothers and sisters did. You just were lucky, now your genetics can be passed forward. A second factor is natural selection. This idea that some organisms are better at passing on their genetic information than other organisms, those organisms that have a higher fitness, get naturally selected to be able to pass their genetic information forward. We do a very similar thing in labs and in breeding facilities all of the time. And we've been doing it for hundreds of years. There are hundreds of different types of dogs. And those dogs have been created through not natural selection, but guided selection called artificial selection. And we'll look at a dog species and be like, that dog has a really cool tail. That dog has really big ears. Let's breed them together and see if we can get dogs that have big ears and cool tails. And pretty soon after this selective breeding process, we have dogs that have big ears and cool tails. Or we can do with corn or fruit flies, and it has become the basis for a lot of the biology that we understand today. So there's a natural analogy that occurs here that maybe the coloration of a beetle makes it less prone or more prone prone to predation. And so as that beetle gets eaten up by predator, it's less likely to pass its genetic information on it. So the beetles that are not as um, uh, fibrous in color and they can hide in the foliage of trees, they don't get consumed as much, and so their genetics get selected and they pass on that information to subsequent generations, creating diversity. A third thing or a third factor is historical events. We know that there have been large volcanic eruptions, that there have been localized floods, that there have been huge changes in climate throughout history, throughout um, natural history. Those historic events are going to have influence here on which organisms proceed towards 
the diversity we have today, which are not going to proceed towards that diversity. Um, most of you probably know from a evolutionary perspective, 65 million years ago is a pretty important date in evolutionary history. That's when the dinosaurs are thought to have been wiped out. Now, a lot of that is actually being modified as we start to understand things more and more. But it looks like there really was a giant asteroid that if you use a evolutionary time clock about 65 million years, it tumbled the Earth and created a huge dis disturbance on our planet. And it was a huge historic event, and that's going to affect progression of a variety of different species as we move forward in history. The fourth factor is a changing environment. environments. We know that there are factors that are changing global carbon emissions, changing the forestation, how many forests are around. Some of them are anthropometric, meaning they come from humans, but a lot of them are natural, are natural things that are happening. Rivers are changing their courses. So we're changing the environment, or the environment is in a constant change of flux and change, and those alterations to the environment in which these organisms live in is is influencing how organisms pass on their genetic information. Um, that's a good question. Part of the answer might come from the Book of Job. The Book of Job talks about the behemoth and the leviathan. People have proposed it's probably juicy health and our rhinoceros. But if you go with the actual little description of those organisms, one. The behemoth that lives in water does not fit a description of a hippo or an alligator or any of the modern organisms that we know about. Um, it actually may be a flea dinosaur, which is a type of dinosaur. Um, Leviathan, uh, some of the descriptions, the seed its tail is like the cedars of Lebanon. That's not an elephant's tail. If you've ever seen an elephant's tail, it's a little wispy thing that has little hair at the very bottom. Um, so it's possible that dinosaurs at one point coexisted with humans, hunted humans, humans hunted them. It's very possible. There is actually evidence that that may be true outside of biblical account. Um, there are fossil beds, and you don't ever hear about this kind of stuff. There are fossil beds where there are actually human, almost alien footprints, hunting parties tracking dinosaurs, or appear to be tracking dinosaurs. Um, the book of Job is, oh man, it's known. Job is very early on. Uh, the book of Job is, I can't remember if it's, if it's actually before the, the global flood or not. Because, I mean, the book of Job is in very, very early manuscripts. It's possible. There's actually there's actually certain places around the world where people still believe indigenous tribes believe that there are dinosaurs. The lion. People have claimed Nessie, the lion's sponsor, is possibly some sort of sword. It lives in this. Um, I, I mean, we're talking about we're talking about things that I think are very very speculative. At some point, what we I think we can conclude is that dinosaurs probably existed on this planet. Is it possible that they could have lived with humans? Yeah, I think it's very possible. And in fact, I think it would be it. Um, humans have, in the biblical account, been here since the very beginning of time, with the very first creation. So. Some of those questions are more difficult to answer. Some of those questions are um, supported in biblical fact only. Some of them have actually some interesting science behind them as well. Okay, so those are the four factors that drive the evolutionary world. Being. In addition to those four factors, we also require time. So evolution requires time. So the terms that have been used 
to describe this requirement is that evolution occurs as descent over time. Then you have these slow changes that occur, and from one generation to the next generation, you don't really see that much of a difference. You look very similar to your parents, and your siblings look very similar to your parents. But if we were able to go back a thousand years and identify from a picture, which probably is not going to happen, but identify one of your ancestors, you're going to look probably quite a bit different. Because there's a thousand years of things that have happened. Because certainly, even if we take the creation perspective, the 6,000 year perspective, that's still a significantly long amount of time compared to the 190 to 100 years that you're probably going to live. So, we're even going to see this descent with time on this time scale of the creation perspective as well. So, this descent with time. We should expect to find slow changes where closely related in time, closely related ancestors appear similar, and more distant ancestors appear different. So this is that idea of descent over time. And given long enough, accumulated changes actually may lead to new species. And those changes over time that could potentially lead, if the time was long enough, to new species would be um, signified if those species were no longer able to interbreed. To produce offspring. So long time could lead to new species that no longer can interbreed to produce offspring. And so two species become different species. Now the last requirement here is to create a system that can respond to all of this, can respond to those four factors, and can utilize time to create ancestor after ancestor that are slowly differentiating. And what that means is that evolution requires a modifiable genetic language. requires a modifiable genetic link language. And that modifiable genetic language, which contains the information, when we alter that information, that's what leads towards the changes. So that modifiable genetic language needs to be able to be manipulated by those factors. So changes depend on the alteration to genes. All of this has been observed. We've seen those four factors over time modifying genetic language to lead to the development of new species. And so it is reported and suspected that biological evolution really occurs on two different levels. As I've just said, we've seen all of this. We've seen all of this happen. We've seen it on a micro level. We've seen micro evolution occur that leads to new species. So I think that very much has happened. However, the 
the second level is the macro level. The micro has been used to infer that the macro is, has happened given a long enough amount of time. And I actually think that that very much can be true. That given a long enough amount of time, the micro evolutionary perspectives and observations should actually occur on a macro evolutionary scale. And that would lead towards large scale changes to a population. We lead to large scale changes in populations around the animal kingdom, around the diversity that we're dealing with here, around the plant kingdom, all of those other organisms. Frequently, it's actually reported that this macroevolution often is due to one factor in particular the environment the changes that occur. Okay, so there it is laid out. Now, let's talk a little bit about the data that supports this. Notice the term model. What does a model mean? It's a representation of a very complex process that tries to dump down so our infinitesimal human brains can understand. So there are scientists around the world working on developing an evolutionary model, trying to understand how we can get from that single cell organism to the diversity that we see today. And there's a lot of really intriguing data. It's all very interesting stuff. Based off of scientific observation, we've been able to make some conclusions about primordial Earth. And primordial Earth, so this would have been Earth 4.6 billion years ago. That primordial Earth, we know, was probably pretty inhospitable. And it was just created by a huge explosion, which was pretty hot. So we got this world, and it may look something similar to this, that's just been created from a large explosion, a big bang, and it's inhospitable, and it's really hot. However, just like you know from our modern understanding of hotness and heat and that sort of stuff, hot things begin to cool down. So this primordial earth is going to begin to cool. So cooling begins. And what happens as this cooling begins is we begin to coalesce water. So water begins to coalesce out of this hot, inhospitable environment. So water begins to form. And it begins to collect up. So all this water begins to form as the, as the earth begins to cool and it begins to collect up. It forms these small hot oceans. So we begin to have H2O. So hydrogen and oxygen are now present in this primordial earth. The environment and especially the atmosphere, it's a very different atmosphere than what we have today. It was electrifying. I mean, it was, it was running hot all the time. And it turns out, and we've actually shown this experimentally, there's a pretty famous experiment called the Yuri Miller experiment, where the primordial atmosphere was recreated in a closed system and was given jolts of lightning, something like spark. So we're giving jolts of electricity into this primordial environment. And what began to happen is we began to see more complex molecules begin to form. We began to get things like carbon dioxide. So now not only do we have hydrogen and oxygen, now we have carbon as well. 
water and carbon are the two most essential things for this life. And so we're doing pretty well at creating water. Now we're able to create, create organic molecules. And again, this is all being confirmed within the laboratory setting. It's all being confirmed that this is maybe even possible. So the atmospheric molecules in this primordial earth are just being bombarded by electricity to create these organic molecules. So we have oxygen, we have carbon, we have hydrogen, we also begin to see nitrogen showing up through these processes. And what begins to happen is these primordial ingredients if you put them into, if you put primordial ingredients into a closed system and give them um, something similar to what we think of as moderate clay, you begin to see more complex molecules begin to develop. So from those organic molecules that have developed, things like RNA, because remember what we're we trying to do here, trying to create that first molecule. We got basically 17 billion years, they're not molecules, 17 billion years to create this first cell. We need RNA, we need lipids, we need proteins, and we need to wrap it all up in a lipid bond. Protein lipid bilayer, put that RNA together. So RNA begins to form in, in, in the clay like environment that would exist near the ground. And when you get RNA, one of the things, and We've actually done this in the lab. It's a thing that uh, is pretty common. RNA can be used to create DNA. So we can create DNA in retrospect from an RNA template. I mean, at this point, we're creating some pretty complex molecules. We also begin to see amino acids can be developed, fatty acids can be developed. We're talking about the nucleotides, glucose energy sources. All of those molecules can be created using the conditions and circumstances that are required by the primordial environment. So with those constitutive components, we now need to begin to take those proteins, that are coming from amino acids, the DNA and the RNA coming from the nucleotides, begin to build larger and larger molecules, combine them together, and then we can form that very first cell. So all of the players really seem to be present to be able to do this. So we get our DNA all wrapped up inside of a membrane. And we have our first single cell organ. Got 17 billion years to do it. And it really looks like it might be possible. Once you get this single cell organism, you begin to have some other changes that occur. Now you begin to actually have oxygen, molecular oxygen, that begins to be produced. So now oxygen from this sort of primordial stew of more and more complex cells, oxygen begins to be released. CO2 is used as an energy source. So we begin to produce oxygen. And as oxygen produce, is produced, remember we're having decreases in heat content of the primordial earth, becoming less and less inhospitable, more and more hospitable. Oxygen begins to change the atmosphere. We're no longer in this atmosphere that's really um, very inhospitable, high levels of argon gas. We're now adding oxygen into the atmosphere. And the Earth gets primed for complex organisms, such as trees, flowers, and multicellular organisms, including humans. So it really looks like there's a possibility that a logical set of scientific biological facts could lead towards the creation 
of at least an environment that can lead towards complex organisms and the diversity that we see today. So we get the Earth prime for con complex organisms, including humans. And if we look at just one particular organism, humans, and sort of look at where we come from and where we are today, that's called phylogenetics, the process of looking at organisms through time, setting up their, um, their ancestral lineage. We can look at man's phylogenetic tree. And really, we come from Africa to a present day. And through that phylo, uh, phylogenetic lineage, the evolution of humans, you can see that we really have been evolving since about 7 million years ago. A lot of this information is from fossil records and things like that, all the way up until the present. So here's Homo sapiens. So this is about a million years. Homo sapiens comes on the scene in the last oh, 5 to 10 percent of that million years, you know, 100,000 years. But I want you to notice a few other things here. A few other critical pieces of information. Adam and Eve were like you and I. Adam and Eve gave rise to Homo sapiens. So if Adam and Eve really were the first people and there was just lineage behind us, God could have never created Adam and Eve. And we've just been a mindless evolutionary process of that. And even further still, even though it appears from everything we understand and know today that Homo sapiens is only hominid on the planet today, not too long ago there were two other contemporaneous hominid species. One of them was colloquially called the hobbit. The correct or the scientific name is Homo floresiensis. Little people that live on this island called the island of Flores, which is near the Philippines. They are now extinct or have died out, but they were contemporaneous with us, with Homo sapiens, modern man, for about uh, about 15 to 20,000 years. There was also an organism called the Neanderthal. Homo, Homo Neanderthal, Neanderthal tensis. Neanderthals lived for quite a long time before Homo sapiens and during much of the historic lineage that we have. And so what that means is when God says, let's make man and woman in our own image, he's not really creating anything that's all that unique. There's already humans on the planet, and there have been humans, human life individuals with similar appearances to us existing for many, many years before us. So I hate to say it, but it looks like evolution wins, and you're nothing special. And then you probably just want to wrap it up, find out something else to do, because this is a meaningless plan. Want to hear the rest of the story? So can humans actually be created? Well, one of the things you'll remember is evolution requires a massive time scale. I think you'll all agree with that, right? So evolution requires a massive time scale. And they can point to radiometric dating, and they can point to the fossil record, and they can point to um, you know, looking at other dating, uh, dating techniques, um, core samples from ice, trees, and pollen, all of that kind of stuff, to try to support that there is a very old Earth. And I will agree, our planet looks like it's old. It looks like it's very cold, in fact. 
And this is in direct conflict with what we would read in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. Because in Gen Genesis chapter 1 and 2, the Bible indicates a very short time scale. And if we hold the semantic and the gra grammatical requirements of the Hebrew language, which much of the Old Testament is written in, and the Greek language that the New Testament is written in, and we look at the genealogies, we have to conclude that literally that the earth is no more than about 6,000 years old. If we allow for a little flexibility, and that would be skipping every other generation in the genealogy, like you know, some generations there was no one really all that important mention. So you skip a generation, then maybe you can stretch it up to ten thousand. Ten thousand is probably a really big stretch. So twenty billion, four point six billion, three billion is drastically different than six thousand. So evolution needs that massive time scale, and it looks like it's very feasible that that what could, is what could have happened. The Bible needs a very short time scale. I think the appearance of the Earth right now favors the evolutionary worldview at the very you know, tip of the iceberg, so to speak, because the Earth does look very old. It seems to be in conflict with, with what's described in the biblical account. In other words, it would appear that the biblical account is counter to things like the fossil record or radiometric dating or these other dating techniques that would indicate that the world really is very old. <clears throat> but I think there's one important question that we should ask here, and that important question is how counter to the Bible is the age of the earth? Are they really diametrically opposed to each other? If the earth is indicated to be old, and the Bible indicates that it's not old, is there any way to rectify those differences? The answer in my mind is yes, and I want to provide you some of the evidence or some of the logic that I turn to when I'm dealing with such questions. And I'm initially turning to the creation story, especially the creation of Adam. And I want to give you a couple interpretations, a couple, um, let's call it exegesis from the text, on what, this, what the story of Adam's creation really shows us, what, what can be taught about the creation of Adam from a biological perspective. First, we have to conclude that Adam functioned from the very point of his creation with intellect. Now, where do I get that? As you read through Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, you will remember that Adam was given the charge by God to name all of the animals. God would bring him an animal, whatever Adam called the animal, that was its name. In addition to that responsibility to name the animals, God also commanded Adam to rule over living things. Okay, so I think we can conclude that Adam functioned with intellect. I think we can also conclude that Adam functioned with motor skills. One of the very first commands God has given man was to cultivate and keep the garden. It can also be interpreted, interpreted as to worship and to pray. Either way, they require functional motor skills. How many babies do you know with very limited motor skills can go out and cultivate a garden? So I think that Adam also functioned with motor skills. I'm just about done here. I want to finish up this point before we moved on, or before I let you go. Does everybody have all of this? Okay. 
Adam was also required to gather his own food in the garden. And he was commanded on which trees and which plants he could eat from. And so that made him self subsistent. So everything that I just pulled out of the text in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, I think indicates one thing, and it's an important thing. It indicates that the intellect, motor skills, and self subsistence that was required are characteristics of adultery. So the characteristics of adulthood. So the, the big kind of take-home message, the first take-home message I want to leave you here today. I'm sorry I'm taking a little extra time here. But I want you to have kind of the wrap-up here before I let you go. Is that Adam, I believe, based off of the biblical text, was an adult at his point of creation. In other words, he was never an infant or a child. And I think the environment that was required for Adam to survive would also have had to have been mature. We couldn't have had little tiny sprouts of blueberry plants or fruit bearing trees and plants and bushes if we needed to feed Adam. We needed full grown, mature plants in order for Adam to be able to be self subsistent. So the take home kind of picture here. Sometimes things can be older than they really are, or appear older than they really are. And we actually see this isn't really all that novel of an idea. You can go to a modern furniture store and you can buy a piece of furniture that has been built in 2016, but its creator created it to look like it was 200 years old. That's where we'll pick up on. Um, it wouldn't function if it was not old. The earth would not function if it, if it was not old. And you needed to sustain man on, on the planet. I mean, literally, if I took you and put you into this room and it had nothing in there, and it's like, all right, so what? It doesn't matter if you're in gold. You can't get out of this room, this room can't support you. It's like, you know, thanks. It has been totally <laughs> 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 <laughs>